Welcome to this video on the finite element method for truss and beam elements. This is one of several videos in a short course on the finite element method posted at Tier Yes Toolbox, a website that contains notes, examples, and algorithms for structural analysis. Please visit the website for more videos and other material relevant for this course. The first slide shows the two elements considered in this video. One is a truss element with length, L, and axial stiffness, EA. The distributed load along the element is denoted by QX. It is selected to make this demonstration of the finite element method by considering two degrees of freedom. That means it is the truss element in the local configuration that we are considering. We could have considered the single degree of freedom truss element in its basic configuration with the same learning outcomes. The other element is a beam element in its basic configuration, namely with two rotational degrees of freedom. The element length is L and the bending stiffness is EI. The reason why we are considering these two elements in this video is entirely pedagogical. It is not necessary to apply the finite element integration procedure in order to obtain the stiffness matrix and load vector for these elements. That is because we can easily solve the differential equation for truss and beam members, giving us the stiffness coefficients that enter the stiffness matrix. From the stiffness method of structural analysis you may already be familiar with the stiffness coefficients, which contain EA over L and EI over L, etc. The fact that you may already be familiar with these elements is exactly the reason why it is pedagogical to apply the finite element methodology to them. It can be difficult to understand the concepts of the finite element method, and these elements can help us learn by seeing results that we are already familiar with. That said, it is only when we consider four node quadrilateral elements in another video in this short course that we get a complete picture of the finite element method and its power. The next slide gives a generic overview of the ingredients of any boundary value problem in solid mechanics. As in many notes and videos posted at Tier Yes Toolbox, equilibrium and sometimes section integration is on the left hand side. Kinematic compatibility is on the right hand side, and material law links the two sides at the bottom. If we combine all those ingredients, then we get the differential equation. The finite element method is an approach for solving such boundary value problems. That is why we will use this type of figure for truss and beam elements as a starting point for the derivations on the subsequent slides. However, the finite element method does not use the differential equation. It turns out that the differential equation is only one of four different forms of a boundary value problem. The next slide names the four forms in red color. The differential equation is called the strong form of the boundary value problem because it implies that equilibrium, kinematic compatibility, and material law must be satisfied at every point in the material that the element is made of. We obtain a weaker form by applying a weight function and integrating over the entire element, which at first seems like a strange action, but it is a powerful step because it opens up to the possibility of calculating approximate solutions to the boundary value problem. If we apply integration by parts to the weighted and integrated form, then we obtain the so-called weak form. We will see later in this video that the weak form is identical to the virtual work formulation of the boundary value problem. It is the weak form that is the basis for the finite element method in this video. There is one more form of boundary value problems in solid mechanics, called the variational form. It is essentially a formulation of energy balance between internal strain energy and potential energy associated with the applied loads. In order to use this form, that is, to use energy methods, it is necessary to be familiar with variational calculus. That means, for instance, differentiating with respect to a function instead of differentiating with respect to a variable, as we learn in basic calculus. The next slide shows the ingredients of the boundary value problem for truss elements. We derived them in the short course on structural members posted at Tier Yes Toolbox. The figure matches the pattern shown earlier, with kinematic compatibility on the right-hand side, etc. Notice the differential equation that appears when we combine all the ingredients. It is that equation that forms the starting point for the derivation of the other forms of the boundary value problem on the next slide. On that slide, we first notice the equivalent notations for the derivative with respect to x in the upper right corner. 
That gives the shorthand notation for the differential equation at the top of the slide. It is important to notice that the differential equation is here written on residual form. That means all quantities are moved to the left-hand side, with zero on the right-hand side. Next, we multiply that equation with a function that is called delta u. For now, this function can be called a weight function, but it will shortly be called a virtual displacement. In the variational formulation, delta u is called a variation. In addition to multiplying with delta u, we also integrate the equation over the entire element, from 0 to L. This is the weighted residual form. It is important for the subsequent developments that there is an equal order of derivative on the displacement, u, and the displacement denoted by delta u. That is the reason why we now apply integration by parts to the first term. As described in detail in the notes posted at Tier Yes Toolbox, the boundary term from the integration by parts vanishes. That is always the case for the boundary value problems we consider. The weak form now exhibits an equal order of derivative on u and delta u. Delta u can now be pronounced as virtual displacement. That is because it will soon be demonstrated that this is also the virtual work form of the boundary value problem. But first, we observe the variational form at the bottom of the slide. It is obtained by anti-variation, but can also be established by adding strain energy and potential energy. The next slide starts with the principle of virtual work. The second equation shows that it is specifically the principle of virtual displacements that is formulated. Notice the volume integral of real stress times virtual strain on the left-hand side, and notice the integral of real load times virtual displacement on the right-hand side. Next, we substitute material law for sigma. Thereafter, we substitute kinematic compatibility for both the real strain and the virtual strain. If we compare the result with the weak form from the previous slide, then we see that the expressions are identical. This proves that the weak form is actually the virtual work form. The next slide takes a major step towards understanding the finite element method. The key words here will be shape functions. The starting point is the weak form of the boundary value problem, derived on the previous slides and shown here at the top of the slide. The most important concept in the finite element method comes next. The displacement anywhere along the truss element, denoted by u of x, is discretized into a vector, n, times a vector, u. The u vector contains the two degrees of freedom of the element. The degrees of freedom, u1 and u2, must not be confused with the displacement u of x on the left-hand side. Let us have a look at n1 and n2, which are called shape functions. They are visualized on the left-hand side of this slide. n1 is equal to 1 at degree of freedom number 1 n2 is equal to 1 at degree of freedom number 2. All shape functions must have that property. Each shape function must be equal to 1 at the location of the degree of freedom it is associated with. It is also important that the shape functions are 0 at all other degrees of freedom. That is why the shape functions on this slide are 0 at the other end. The physical understanding of a shape function is that it shows the amount of displacement along the element due to a unit displacement along the degree of freedom it is associated with. Notice how n1 shows the amount of axial displacement if you set u1 equal to 1. Similarly, notice how n2 shows the amount of axial displacement if you set u2 equal to 1. The expressions for these two shape functions are shown here. We now return to the weak form and substitute the discretization, n times u. We do that both for the real and the virtual displacement. The result is shown below, but this is too messy to work with. To clean up, we take the following actions. First, we take the transpose of the second parenthesis in the first term. This may seem strange, because that parenthesis evaluates to a scalar quantity. However, that is the reason why it makes no difference to the final result if we transpose a scalar. It remains the same scalar. But it makes a difference in the organization of this equation because that scalar is the product of two vectors. When we take the transpose of a vector product, then we change the order of the vectors and transpose each of them. Next, we change the order of the two parentheses in that first term. Finally, 
we pull the virtual displacement vector, delta u, outside the integrals. The result of those actions is shown below. Because the virtual displacements are arbitrary, the only way for this expression to be zero is that the outer parenthesis is zero. That is spelled out in the last equation, where we have moved the loading term to the right-hand side. Notice that n prime transpose times n prime is a matrix. A celebration is now in order, because that expression is actually the stiffness matrix times the displacement vector being equal to the load vector. In other words, when we evaluate those integrals, which means integrating each component in the matrix or vector in the integrand, then we get the matrix and vectors on the right-hand side. That is exactly the stiffness matrix that we are familiar with from a basic exposure to the stiffness method. In summary, the finite element method means discretizing the weak form of the boundary value problem using shape functions, in order to obtain the stiffness matrix and load vector for an element. The next slide shows the boundary value problem for Euler-Bernoulli beam bending. Equilibrium and section integration are on the left-hand side. Kinematic compatibility is on the right-hand side, and material law is at the bottom. The differential equation at the top emerges when we combine all those ingredients. That differential equation is copied to the top of the next slide, reorganized to residual form. Next, we multiply the entire equation with a weight function, delta w, and integrate over the entire element. That gives the so-called weighted residual form. Next, we apply integration by parts in order to get the same order of derivative on w and delta w. The boundary term of integration by parts cancels, as described in detail in the notes posted at Tier Yes Toolbox, and we are left with this expression, called the weak form, which will soon be shown to be the virtual work form of the boundary value problem. But first we see that anti-variation, or equivalently, the sum of internal strain energy and potential energy in the external load, gives the expression at the bottom of the slide. The next slide starts with the principle of virtual work. The second equation shows that it is specifically the principle of virtual displacements that is formulated. Notice the volume integral of real stress times virtual strain on the left-hand side, and notice the integral of real load times virtual displacement on the right-hand side. Next, we substitute material law for sigma. Thereafter, we substitute kinematic compatibility for both the real strain and the virtual strain. We also carry out the cross-section integration which means integrating z squared over the cross-section, which gives the moment of inertia. If we compare the result with the weak form from the previous slide, then we see that the expressions are identical. This proves that the weak form is actually the virtual work form of the boundary value problem. The next slide shows the finite element discretization for the beam element. The starting point, at the top of the slide, is the weak form of the boundary value problem. Next, we write the displacement anywhere along the element, w of x, as a vector of shape functions times the vector of degrees of freedom. For the beam element, the degrees of freedom are rotations. That means shape function number 1 must have a unit rotation at degree of freedom number 1, with zero rotation at the other degree of freedom. That is exactly what is shown with a red line on the left-hand side, where the equations for the shape functions are also provided. Similarly, Shape function n2 has a unit rotation at degree of freedom number 2, and zero rotation at the other degree of freedom. We now follow the same derivation procedure as for the truss element. We first substitute the discretization, n times u, into the weak form. We do that both for the real and the virtual displacement. The result is shown below, and to clean up, we take the following actions. First, we take the transpose of the second parenthesis in the first term. That means taking the transpose of a scalar, which does not change anything, except, when we take the transpose of a vector product, then we change the order of the vectors of the product, and transpose each of them. Next, we change the order of the two parentheses in that first term. Finally, we pull the virtual displacement vector, delta u, outside the integrals. The result of is shown below. Because the virtual displacements are arbitrary, the only way for this expression to be zero is that the parenthesis is zero. That is spelled out in the last equation, where we have moved the loading term to the right-hand side. 
Notice that n double prime transpose times n double prime is a matrix. By evaluating the integral for all components of that matrix, we obtain the expression shown on the right hand side. Again, we have derived the well-known stiffness matrix for a basic beam element in an entirely new manner, by using integration. Again, we observe that the finite element method means discretizing the weak form of the boundary value problem using shape functions, in order to obtain the stiffness matrix and load vector for an element. Before ending this video, it should be said that the finite element integration does not always give exact results, as it did here for the truss and beam elements. The reason we got exact solutions is that we used shape functions that describe exactly the correct displaced shape of the element. For example, for the beam element, we used third-order polynomial shape functions. That is exactly the solution to the differential equation for those beam cases. In many situations we use good but not perfect shape functions. In that case, the finite element method gives good but still approximate results. It is when we address elements like that, such as the four-node quadrilateral element covered in this short course on the finite element method, that we get the full sense of the advantages and pitfalls of the method. Thanks for watching this video. Please visit Tier Yes Toolbox for more videos and more material relevant for the modern structural engineer. See you soon.